G'day, I'm James, and here's a curious question. Can one use the area model just willy-nilly? Okay, well, this is a very strange question. What do I mean by that? First, what do I even mean by the area model? So we're talking about the area model first, because actually I love the area model. It's great for doing complicated, complicated computations with thinking. For example, if I had to work out 37 times 21, and I didn't care about thinking, then the smart thing to do is get out your smartphone. If I just want the answer, get out your smartphone. That's what any smart thinking adult in the 21st century would do. Done. But if I want to actually think my way through this for an exercise of just logic and intellect and all that, I say to myself, okay, 37 times 21, I don't like those numbers, it's horrible. But actually, I can think of this not as an arithmetic problem, but as a geometry problem. I could ask, what is the area of a rectangle that's 37 by 21? Because working out that area would be working out exactly that computation. And the reason I like the area is because I don't like the number 37, it's a horrible number. I don't like the number 21, but I can see how to chop up those numbers literally into friendlier numbers. For example, instead of doing 30 and 7, I can literally do 30 and 7. So 37, 30, and 7. So doing 21 inches, I can do 20 inches and 1 inch. 20 inches and 1 inch. And I've chopped up the rectangle to four pieces, and the numbers associated with each piece are much friendly. I can work out each individual area, like this one is just 7 times 20, 140. This one is just 30 times 1, 30. This one is 1 times 7, 7. 20 times 30, 600. Those individual areas are fine to work out, and now I can see the area of the whole rectangle. 37 times 21 must be 600, plus 140 is 740, uh, 770, 777. Beautiful, beautiful. And in fact, that's how we can even teach the standard algorithm. If we still need to teach the standard algorithm on pencil and paper, because that's important in the 21st century apparently, great, we can do it this way as well. Here's the standard algorithm we'll do over here, 37 times 21. Uh, you could do it this way, 1 times 7 is literally 7. 1 times 3 was actually 30. 1 times 30 is really 30. 2 times 7 was really 20 times 7 is 140. And 2 times 3 is really 20 times 30 is 600. And all I need to do is add up those pieces because they're exactly the pieces right there. Add them up 7, 7, 7. But apparently we still live in a society in the 21st century where ink is precious and that used up too much ink. So we actually teach kids to do this still to this day. 1 times 7 is 7. We'll allow them to write that, just like we did before, but 1 times 30 is 3, but we put the 3 up there. Don't repeat a 0. Ooh, that's too confusing. Then we actually make, oh no, but do write a 0. And then go 2 times 7 is 14, but don't write 14, write a 4 and put a 1 up there. And then go 2 times 3 is 6 and then a 7. Add 1 to make 7 and then add those instead. 7, 7, 7. Whoa, whoa, that's crazy. But actually, do you see this is really a compact form of this? There's the 30 and the 7, 37. There's the 140 and the 600, 740 added together. Saved ink, because ink is really precious to this day. But actually, what I love about this is 37 times 21. Well, if I flip it around, if I do the standard algorithm, it looks completely different. 7 times 1 is 7. 7 times 2 is 14. We do actually write 14 there, but then we can't put a 0 there. 3 times 1 is 3. We let's write that. Then 3 times 2 is 6. We write that and add up this way, 7, 7, 7. But look, that looks completely different. And it's quite surprising that we get the same answers. So if I asked, why can you just flip the order multiplications if all you know is the standard compact ink version from the 1700s, this would be mysterious. But actually, 37 times 21 has to be the same as 21 times 37. If I just turn the picture around 90 degrees, it's going to be exactly the same areas, but it's going to be exactly this computation here. It has to be the same answer in the end. I love the area model. That's the area model for arithmetic. It makes perfectly good sense. All right, but then what about my question? Can we just use it willy-nilly? Well, then here's why I'm asking this question, because suddenly we go from grade school, primary school, to high school, we do things not in base 10, but you start to do things in base X, any old base you like. And you might ask things like, what is 3X plus 7 times 2X plus 1? Now, I'll do it in yellow again so you can see it, and what we'll draw there is exactly the same area model, okay? So it'll be a rectangle that's 3x plus 7 inches wide, 2x plus 1 inches down, but I'll chop it up into pieces that are 3x and 7, 3x plus 7, 2x and 1, 2x and 1, and voila, I'll work out the individual areas. 3x times 2x makes 6x squared. 7 times 2x makes 14x's. 1 times 7 is 7, and 3x times 1 is 3x. And apparently the answer is uh, 6x squared, and uh, 14 plus 3 is 17x's, and 7. All right, great, no questions to be asked there, except there are questions to be asked right there. This was the area model. In the area model, areas and side lengths have to be positive numbers. It's geometry, positive side lengths, positive areas. 
looks so good so far there. In fact, if x really was 10 in my brain, I've just worked out 37 plus 21 as 30 and 7, 20 and 1. If x is 10 in my head, I am getting 600, I am getting 140, I am getting 30, I'm getting 7. So if x is 10, this is valid. But what if x was a negative number in the spectrum? What if x was, say, negative 10? Then this side here would be a side length of negative 30. Doesn't make sense in geometry. Seven's okay. This would be a side length of negative 20. Doesn't make sense in geometry. One is okay. Seven's okay. Area of three times negative 10, negative 30. Doesn't make sense in geometry. Doesn't make sense in geometry. That would be okay. Whoa. So actually, in algebra class, we don't know what number x is. It could be a positive number, in which case the area model is fine. Or it could be a negative number, in which case the area model is completely questionable. You can't have negative side lengths, you can't have negative areas in geometry. That's my question. Am I allowed to just do that? Can I use the area model even in an algebra class? We all seem to do it. Why? Can we just use it willy nilly like that? Well, let's talk about it. That's the point of this video. So let me clean the board and go through the whole philosophical discussion about does or does the area model apply or not apply in algebra class as well. Okay, see you back in a moment. Okay, in order to get into the question whether the area model can be used just willy-nilly or not, we actually need to go back to the very beginning of mathematics. So let me ask you this. What do you think is the very first mathematical activity humankind ever took part in? What do we humans first do mathematically? And you might think about this for a while. Hmm, what do we humans first do mathematically? You might think, oh, it's probably counting. We probably counted things, like counted five fingers in our hand. We probably counted 17 elephants in a field. We probably counted 365 days in a year, and so on. So basically, all of mathematics probably began with the counting numbers, the numbers that count things. So one, two, three, four, five actually counts discrete objects, which is grand. Actually, there's a question here. Some people might argue there's another number to go at the beginning of this list, maybe the number zero. In fact, we humans debated over that issue for many, many centuries. Is zero a counting number or not? Because here's the trouble. I have to know there are zero giraffes in this filming studio right now. Is that because I observed a lack of giraffes? Or did I actually count zero giraffes? Did I actually count or did I not count? That's the issue with zero. Is it a counting number or is it not? It doesn't matter. Anyway, and for what we're doing today, we'll work with some counting numbers. Some people might say, yes, zero is in the list. Zero is not in the list. Doesn't matter. Because we're just going to count things and make this very simple and straightforward. And for people who know me, they know I like to count dots in particular. So I will, in this video, count dots. So when I write five in my brain, I'm thinking a picture of five dots, which I can count to five. There's five dots. Now, thinking about the counting numbers, you can actually count things, great, but you can actually start to do mathematics. For example, we might do addition. For example, I might do 2 plus 3. And in my mind, it's a picture of two dots together with three dots, and lo and behold, yes, that's five dots. But here's the thing, there's something lovely about this. Because I did two dots followed by three dots looking left to right. But if I change my perspective and go right to left, I actually see three dots plus two dots. Now, it's the same picture, so philosophically I just know, without even saying 5, these have to be the same answer. But of course, 2 plus 3 is 5 dots, there they are, and 3 plus 2 is 5 dots, there they are. But the lovely thing about that is, this actually says something. I don't actually have to draw the picture of 197 plus 296 dots. I just know if I did it, I could read it left to right and see that sum. I could read it right to left and see this sum instead, 296 plus 197. And I know in my mind's eye, it's the same picture. Therefore, I can just argue philosophically and have to get the same answer without even doing the arithmetic. This is a lovely thing. I can see in my mind's eye a general truth about the counting numbers. A plus B must equal B plus A, no matter which two counting numbers I happen to be thinking about for A and B. Beautiful. So we can start to identify some things that seem just obviously patently true about the counting numbers. Um, other things might be like if you want to actually include zero in the study, um, A dots plus no more dots leaves me with A dots and so on. So you can list lots of different properties about this. Grand. And then after a while you might say, okay, I might want to start doing something like lots of additions. I might start doing repeated additions. And you might come up with the notion of multi multiplication. Because in the context of just the counting numbers, multiplication manifests itself as repeated addition. So for example, when I write 4 times 3, what I'm really thinking of is 4 groups of 3. That is repeated addition. I've got one group of 3 plus another group of 3 plus a third group of 3 plus a fourth group of 3. And of course, that would make 12 dots if I were to actually draw them out. Now here's the funny thing. 
This definition of multiplication in this context, repeat addition, is actually kind of unsymmetrical. Four groups of three. That's actually very different from this. Three groups of four. That would be, well, three groups of four groups of four, which is actually a different object. It's a four plus another four plus another four. Very different. But the amazing thing, it gives me 12 again, the same answer. Hmm. Now, I know we've all been trained to think that, of course, four times three is the same as three times four, but it's actually not obvious. It's this unsymmetrical definition. In fact, if I were to ask you to draw 197 groups of 296, and then draw 296 groups of 197, how do you actually for sure know that's going to be the same count of dots in the end? It's not actually obvious. Well, it is, but it takes some deep thinking. You have to have like one of these like aha moments, because you realize, Oh, if I was to draw repeated additions in a very systematic way, four groups of three, here's one group of three. Then I'll do a second group of three as a row underneath. I'll do a third group of three as a row underneath, and a fourth group of three as a row underneath. Keep it very systematic. Then when I look this way, I am seeing four groups of three. But if I then change my perspective and look this way down at the columns, I'm actually seeing three groups of four. So actually, this one picture is showing me four groups of three, and at the same time showing me three groups of four. Therefore, without doing the arithmetic, I know they have to give the same answer. And I can see if I had a more bigger, deeper picture, bigger picture in my mind, I could actually, in my mind's eye, imagine drawing this. 197 rows of 296, but if I then change my perspective, I look down column-wise and see 296 or 197, I can see they have to be the same answer. This is amazing. So we're seeing that A times B, despite the definition being unsymmetrical, turns out to be symmetrical in the answers they give. That's actually kind of mind-blowing. That's amazing about multiplication and the counting numbers. This repeated definition of multiplication actually is symmetrical in the end, even though it doesn't start off being symmetrical. Wow! I've actually, I kind of love this, because look what I did here. I actually drew a little rectangle of dots, which is bringing me back to the area model. Because what we've really got here, actually, I suppose I could let go of drawing dots and draw unit squares instead. Because if I actually made that a rectangle of unit squares, so we'll do what, a four by three, I guess my picture's out of whack here, but I can do a column of four and rows of three. I'm actually seeing four uh, groups of three unit squares this way, or three groups of four unit squares that way. I'm actually seeing three times four, four times three in this picture. And of course, it's the area of 12, it's 12 unit squares in total. Great, so that brings me back from dots to back to the area model. And this rule here is actually going to be what I said before. We can imagine just turning this 90 degrees and see this as three groups of four instead. And of course, the area hasn't changed, it's still 12. So the area model says, yeah, this is consistent. In the counting numbers, this is absolutely right for multiplication. Beautiful. But actually, a bit more is because what I was doing earlier was not just turning uh, rectangles around. Uh, 90 degrees, I was actually chopping up rectangles. For example, if I chopped up this 3 and made it a 2 and a 1, so I've got two pieces of area, I get an area of 8 and an area of 1 times 4 is 4, it's still area 12. And if I chop up the 4 as well, so maybe into a 2 and a 2, chop the 12 into a 2 and a 2, now I get four, air, four pieces, area uh, 2 times 2 is 4, 1 times 2 is 2, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, it's still total area 12. In fact, we can just chop up the rectangle, no matter how we chop it up, the area is going to be 12. So that's actually another belief about the counting numbers. That if we can see it's true, that we can chop up, uh, chop up areas. I'll just say that. I mean, it's a little loose and strange, but you know what I mean by that. In fact, mathematicians have a very precise name for this property. It's called the distributive rule. But we can see the distributive rule is true. No matter how we chop up rectangles, we know the area is always going to stay the same. Brilliant. So off we go, we start you know, writing down more and more, more things that are patently and obviously true about the counting numbers. If you want to start doing zero, you might say um, A groups of nothing is nothing. I guess it makes sense. Or if I think in terms of rectangles, a rectangle that's like A inches by zero inches, I guess it has no area, kind of makes sense. So there's, there's all these rules we can start listing that just seem so blatantly and patently true about the counting numbers. That is great, fabulous, I love this. So here we are. All these listing all these things that are clearly true about our fabulous counting numbers. But then we humans like to make things complicated. We make our lives complicated, we start doing more things. We don't just count things, we actually start like interacting with each other with trades and, and business and all the rest. So you might actually say, oh goodness, we might need more types of numbers. 
We might be talking about not just profits we make with each, uh, in our interactions with each other, but might end up having debts, in which case we might want like things like numbers which are called negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, which is like anti-profit. Or we might start measuring temperatures and having like nice warm days and positive degrees and sub-zero cold days in negative degrees. Or we might start doing sophisticated mathematics on a number line. We want some numbers going off to the right that are positive, some numbers going off to the left that are negative. We might start inventing new types of numbers. In fact, we might start inventing the negative numbers, the negative uh, integers and the positive integers. Then that says, okay, sure, we can do that. We've got all these different models for these, temperatures, number lines, profit and uh, debt and all the rest. But the question is, these, these beliefs here are plainly true for the counting numbers. Is there any reason to believe these are true for these new types of numbers as well? And that's a serious question. Now, you know, we've got different models in our mind, but maybe it is about profit and debt. For example, this first one, I could say, all right, does this first one still make sense in, mod in profits and, and debt? If I have a debt of $2, but I still have $3 in my pocket, I guess I'm up $1 overall. Can I just switch this around? Well, let's think. If I have $3 in my pocket, but I still owe someone $2, I guess I'm still $1 up overall. It feels sense. I feel like this makes sense. I feel like that makes sense in the model of profit and debt. And maybe that makes sense as well. But these ones, these multiplication ones, they get scary. They get very scary. For example, if I'm still thinking repeated addition, if that's like what's in my brain right now for multiplication, then maybe something like three times negative two is fine. That makes sense. It's three groups of negative twos. There's a negative two and a negative two and a negative two, which would be a negative six. Great, got an answer, negative six. But then if I did something like this, negative three times two, I start to get worried. Because I don't actually know, if I listen to my words, negative three groups of two. I have no idea what to write down. I actually have no idea what to write down. If I try to try and make sense of this in terms of like profits and debt, uh, negative three groups of a profit of two. Okay, maybe that's negative six or something. It's kind of weird. Uh, temperature. I don't really know. Walking on a number line, facing forward, facing backwards. I don't really know, actually. I'm being honest here. I don't actually really know what this means. So I'm sure many people are you know, yelling at the screen right now, just do the obvious thing. Well, what's the obvious thing? It's this. You just switch it around. If I'm confused by negative three times two, make it two times negative three. Two groups of negative three is what I was just doing earlier, in which case it's two times groups of negative three, negative six, and I've got an answer. But here's the thing. Just switch it around. Just switch it around. You've just done something. You just said to me, you believe in this rule. You believe that this rule that makes perfect sense of positive counting numbers should hold for all types of numbers. It feels so good, so right, it should work for every single time. And if you do that, great, I'm with you. If we're allowed to switch numbers around, we'll get an answer of negative six. And maybe I can explain that in terms of de debit and prof profit and all the rest. I don't know. It's hard. It's really hard, actually. But if you say, I want to believe this rule works for all types of numbers, then off we go. Life is grand. In fact, that's the game we play. That's the very honest thing. I just want to be very explicit about this. These rules feel so right, so obvious, so natural to us in the positive number realm that we feel so compelled to say, these are so natural, they should hold for all numbers, for negative numbers. Even for like weird things like fractions and irrational numbers and complex numbers, we feel these rules are so natural, so right, they should hold for all numbers. In which case, if that's the game you want to play, I'll play it with you. But I want to let you know, we are playing the game, believe. We only have reason to believe these numbers as human beings for positive counting numbers. But they feel so right, we just want to believe the hold for all, all numbers, in which case, feel free. But let's be explicit and clear about it. We're playing the game of believing these rules are so right and so good, we're gonna do it. Now, you don't have to believe them. In fact, you can actually create other types of arithmetic where this, these rules don't necessarily hold, and they're valid in their own right. But here's the thing, in the school world, we actually have chosen to believe this. And no one tells us that we've chosen to believe them. It's just done in the, in the textbooks, just believe these rules and no one says that we're believing them. That's the game we're actually playing. I'm being really honest. And here's how I'm gonna be even more honest. It's these ones. These ones in particular, we are believing that rectangles work the way they do, not just for the positive numbers, but for all numbers. That is, we can turn rectangles 90 degrees, even if the numbers are weird. We can chop up areas and, and add them what the individual areas, even if the numbers are weird. Did you catch me? We're choosing to believe that. In which case, we're, trying to, we're choosing to believe that the pictures we draw with the area model are true for all types of numbers. Now, they might not speak truth in geometry. We're gonna get some weird side lengths, we're gonna get some weird areas, but we are choosing to believe that what they speak is truth about arithmetic. 
All right, let me show you what I mean by that. Here goes, I'll do 17 times 18. Let's focus on that one with the area model. I'll do the standard, what we know is true and fine for positive whole numbers. 17 times 18, I'll split them to 10 and seven, 10 and eight, because they're much friendlier numbers. I don't like hard numbers. 10 times 10 is uh, 100, seven times 10 is 70, 80 and 56. In which case 17 times 18 is 100 plus another 150, 250 plus 56 is uh, 306, 306. All right, now we have chosen to believe that this area model works for all types of numbers. So let me do the same thing, but get kind of strange. Well, I'll keep the 17 the same as 10, seven. Let me get strange with the 18. Let me think of this as 20 and negative two. Cannot have a side length of negative two in geometry, but we're saying we believe this picture is still speaking truth in arithmetic. Let's check. 10 times 20, 200. 7 times 20, 140. Uh, 10 times negative 2, 10 groups of negative 2, I guess we did that, is negative 20. 7 groups of negative 2 is negative 14. 200 plus 140, 340. Take away 20, 320. Uh, take away 14, 306. It's speaking truth in arithmetic. I know a negative side length, a negative area makes no sense, but we're saying we believe it even in this strange situation here. Um, all right, so let me get strange with uh, not the 18 this time, we get strange with the 17. Let's do 20 and negative three for 17. And this time I'll keep the 18 the same, 10 and the eight, let's check it again. Uh, 10 times 20 is 200. 10 times negative three is negative 30. Uh, eight times negative three is negative 24. Eight times 20 is 160. So I've got 200, 160, 360, take away 30, 330, take away 24, 306. That's the thing. Even though these pictures don't make sense in geometry, we're saying we choose to believe the pictures speak truth about arithmetic nonetheless. And there are gonna be consequences. Let me show you one of the consequences right now of that belief. It's this one. Here goes. I will now get strange, not just with the 17, but I'll get strange with the 17 and the 18 at the same time. Because there's an age-old question out there. What is negative times negative? Why is negative times negative positive? We've all been trained to say that. Well, the answer is it's a consequence of our beliefs that the area model works no matter what. In which case, here goes. 20 times 20 is 400. All right, 20 times negative three is negative 60. Negative, uh, 20 times negative two is negative 40, and negative three times negative two is the weird one. But we know the answer is 306. We've just done it three, uh, three times. In which case, I've got no choice. The math is telling me to get the answer 306, this better be 400, take away 60 minus 40, that's one, 300, this better be positive six. As a consequence of believing, these basic properties that are so clear and obvious to the counting numbers, positive counting numbers, we want them whole for all numbers, is that negative times negative has to be positive. That's the true explanation of why negative times negative is positive. Now I've done it in terms of pictures, you can write them out just the pure rules, but that's the truth about that, about that right now. So here's the thing. So can we use the area model willy-nilly, even in algebra class? The answer is yes, because we believe we can. We've chosen to believe we can. So x plus seven times x plus eight. So if x was 10 in this case, there'll be 17 times 18, would actually be this picture. Uh, x plus seven, x plus eight, x times x is x squared, uh, seven x, uh, uh, 8x and 56 is x squared plus 15x plus 56. And if x really is 10, 17 times 18, this is 306. Well, we know it works for nice positive whole numbers, great. But here's the thing, we've chosen to believe it works for all types of numbers. So even if x is negative, like negative 10 or negative four or negative 45, this is still speaking arithmetic truth. So can we use the area model just willy nilly? Yes, because we've chosen to believe we can. That's the answer. So just go for it, loads of fun. And here's the amazing thing about mathematics. Even though this feels like an abstract, arbitrary choice, it still models the real world in ways that make sense to us. This actually seems to work in how the real world goes around us. So this is the amazing thing about mathematics. We might feel like we're making independent choices here, yes, no, and all the rest, but actually we seem to be onto something, it all fits together beautifully. So the philosophical conundrum about how math just works and fits the real world is just beautiful, mysterious, and amazing. You've just got to love maths.